Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast presented by Onyx. On this episode, I'm joined by Kate Mastis of Maven. Kate is one of the masterminds behind Maven Optics and has been in the optics industry for quite some time. He knows glass. We break down binoculars, spotting scopes, rifle scopes, and range finders to help you better understand what makes quality optics and how you can choose the right ones for your hunt or hunts. As I said, this episode is brought to you by Onyx. The Onyx Hunt app is your premier GPS hunting app that turns your phone into a working GPS. And, well, this time of year, I'm scouring maps on the desktop version of the app to look for areas to scout during the spring and to be able to take those with me in the field on the app. So, like, as of today, I was out in the woods, I was scouting after work, and I'll also turn the tracking feature on so you can track where you walked, how far you walked, the distance, everything. And and I do that to, especially if I'm looking for shed, so I can see what areas I've covered and what areas I do need to cover, as well as being able to, to mark access routes, anything like that with the tracking feature. So if you want to check that out, along with all the other features that come with Onyx, head over to onyxmaps.com and use the coupon code EMW to save yourself 20%. Tethered. Tethered is a company founded on the principles of educating the hunting community on saddle hunting while creating the most innovative, lightweight, safe products for saddle hunting. I'm using the Phantom Saddle Setup with the Predator platform for all of my mobile hunts, and I just saw that they had released some new knee pads that aren't available yet on their website, but they came out with them um, at a show recently. And if you're not familiar with knee pads and saddle hunting, it's very difficult to find ones that work perfectly for that. So I'm excited to get to check those out. If you want to check out uh, all of Tethered's products and just learn more about saddle hunting, head over to tetherednation.com. Maven Optics. Maven is building the highest quality optics at half the price of their competitors through their direct-to-consumer business model. They want to create the best optics for the job, period. Their products are backed with a lifetime no-fault warranty and an incredible customer experience. I'm using the B2 9x45 binos in all of my western hunts. It's an absolute low-light monster, allowing you to see through the binos longer than you can, even with your naked eyes, as you'll hear the reason behind that on this podcast here with with Cade. So if you want to check out Maven Optics, you can use the coupon code EASTMEETSWEST-GIFT and get a free gift with any full-price optics order at mavenbuilt.com. And last but not least, Spartan Forge. Hunters require an accurate forecast of the best hunting days and the best hunting spots to save time on scouting and executing the hunts. The Spartan Forge Outfitter utilizes years of military background and machine learning to pull from millions of data points to accurately predict deer movement, and that includes GPS data, 30 years of weather, academic and state research. So they're using science rather than someone's opinion, and it's based on your specific hunting area. So that's what I like when when I'm out scouting this spring or if I'm looking at my trail camera data from the past years and trying to figure out why was this deer, you know, moving in daylight on this day versus other days, this app is is designed to help you understand that and to be able to help you predict movement in the future. If you want to check out the outfitter, you can use the coupon code East Meets West to save 25% at SpartanForge.ai. All right, so the Mountain Buck story of the week, or otherwise known as Mountain Buck Monday, over on social media, comes from Luke Pyle. And Luke says, I took some of your advice and checked out a new cut in Pennsylvania on public land. Throwing a camera in one after scouting in August. I sat till I grabbed it on Sunday the 7th of November. 
based on the intel I got in there Monday morning for a hanging hunt with my sticks and saddle, at 8 a.m. I had a buck walking to the left and right on a bench above me at about 70 yards in the treetops on the ground in the cut. I was on the transition of the cut on a bench below. I grunted. He looked but didn't seem interested. I lost sight of him and couldn't tell if he worked off or laid down. At 8.45 a.m., I seen him again in the same spot, so he obviously laid down. I hit him with a rattle, and he wasn't interested and laid back down. I waited about a half hour and gave a pretty hard rattling sequence. He stood up, groomed himself, and laid back down. So now I, so now I was like, what the heck? I'm going to try something non-traditional. Slowly climbed down from my predator platform, took off my jacket and saddle, just took my bow and rangefinder. I ranged a large oak that the buck was by as a marker of where to work towards and proceeded to slowly crab crawl and walk to the right up the cut. It took me about an hour and 15 minutes to move about 45 yards. The wind was less than five miles per hour left to right, so I was in a great position wind-wise. As you remember, it was 60 to 70 degrees on that day, so the, the leaves were a challenge for noise. But once I got into the cut where the leaves were limited, I had to work through the thickness, but more quiet. I assumed I was at around 20 yards when I stopped moving and just sat, assuming he was still there. Less than 30 minutes later, I see antlers rise up with him standing up. I stood and went to full draw with him looking at me, standing perfectly to his side. The window was small with a branch running across his body, but I had the vitals open and knew it was about 15 yards. I released and made a perfect heart shot. This all took place in seconds from when I saw his antlers. He went less than 40 yards and crashed. I never thought I'd be able to ground stalk a buck, but in hindsight, I was like, what do I have to lose? By the way, I did it all in my East Meets West hat, the same one that I killed my public land turkey in in the spring. And I had to share this and appreciate all the work you do with the content. I have to say that this story from Luke is one of my favorites. And as far as being able to adapt to the situation and get aggressive and it worked out in his favor, I think, (laughs) I think there's a lot to learn from this one and, and, uh, just an awesome story. If you head over to the East meets West hunt, Instagram and East meets West outdoors and Facebook. You can check out the photo of Luke's buck and just an awesome Pennsylvania public land buck. So thanks for sharing Luke. And also in other news, uh, I I released a couple new hats last week, which I mentioned on last week's podcast, but this one, so I got the, the timber cut and the saloon trucker hats, those are both live on the website and shipping now. So head over to eastmeetswesthunt.com slash shop and check those out. And as I mentioned a little bit in the intro talking about Onyx, I finally got out scouting. It was actually today as I record this. Um, so Monday evening after work, I only had an hour and a half. But I wanted to get back into this spot that I knew that I could get to as far as that the uh, there wasn't any ice on the roads or anything, and and it was about a mile and a half back on this ridge to get to a camera I set up the first day of of archery season. I hadn't been back since. Didn't really have uh, a ton of expectations based on photos I had had gotten in the in the past as far or actually in just in the summer really in the area. So I I don't know I didn't put a whole lot of weight on it, but. I was really surprised by this camera pull. I had some really good bucks and I knew that this spot that there was, it was a doe bedding area on the edge or just in the interior of this about four year old cut because I sat through the first day archery and watched all these does bed down there. So I had set up the camera right on the, the edge of the cut on a big scrape and all through November I had just bunch of bucks coming through checking some some really good bucks some great up and comers i mean really good spot learned a lot from leaving that camera soak and actually even had some good late season photos in in daylight coming to feed in that cut so i was uh was pleasantly surprised by that and now with the warmer weather coming in this week i plan to be in the woods a lot more and uh 
to get to check that out. And I also have some really good guests coming up uh, on the podcast this week. I'm recording with Brian Barney, who's a host of the Eastman's Elevated podcast, as well as Donnie Vincent and then Bill Thompson from Spartan Forge. So big lineup this week to record podcasting and to release in the coming weeks. Uh, I've been, it's been a, a dream of mine to be able to talk with Donnie Vincent as he was one of the ones that originally motivated me to want to start adventure hunting. So I'm really, really excited to, uh, to get to talk with him this week and then be able to share it with everybody else. But anyways, I want to thank everyone for listening and checking out the podcast here. If you do like it, I would love if you went over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to it and give a rating and a review that helps out a ton. And I hope everyone has a great week. Enjoy this podcast with Cade Mastis of Maven. All right, we're live. Cade, it is uh, good to be seeing your smiling face again. Yeah, it's good. Uh, good to be here. Unfortunate we didn't get a get together like we always do in Harrisburg this year. It's one of the things I look forward to every year, and with all the chaos going on, um, it's unfortunate that we don't get to see our East Coast friends this year as readily as we used to. So it's nice to nice to get on here and catch up. Yeah. So for anyone that's listening, you probably heard it in the intro that I that I did, but. This is Cade Mastis. What your what's your position? I know you're a owner sales operation for Maven. VP of operations and sales is my fancy little title at the bottom of my email. Uh, <laughs> yeah, go that... boy. I think is you know just pretty much what whatever needs to get done. But yeah, I'm one of the three partners, and I kind of oversee the the warehouse uh, shipping, receiving that end of it. I do product development for rifle scopes and range finders. And then Mike is uh, one of my other business partners. He does finance and administration, customer service, et cetera. And he's the product uh, manager for spotting scopes and binoculars. And then Brendan, <clears throat> our third partner, he is uh, design, marketing, advertising, and makes everything look good for us. Yeah. And you guys have a, a relatively small team for the the brand that you've built and i did notice on the the website looks like you've added a few team members in the last year is that right yeah we've so we're at 10 people right now um we were at 11 over the holidays we brought in a a a part-timer to help us get some shipping out Uh, we're back to 10 but we did just post a position today for a new uh, customer service person to help us out and then we'll probably add a couple more um, this summer and fall. So we're growing. We're on a path to have some pretty substantial growth. Um, it's funny, you know, that we've been growing at about 40% a year or so, something like that. And and when it's small numbers, you know, 40% over $100,000 isn't much. But when you start getting into bigger numbers, 40% of, you know, binoculars that you sell 40% next year and 40, you know, that growth rate really starts to take on some numbers. And we, we've had some fun things in the last year, you know, the packaging we would always buy, you know, we buy it by the, the pallet load and you'd walk by a full pallet and go, Oh, that's six months worth. And now it's like, Oh, that's six weeks worth. And no, oh, no, we're in trouble because it's yeah, times are so long and just, you know, the pains of growing, but it's uh, I'd rather have the growing pains than, you know, wonder having to have hard conversations with people. So, yeah. It's an all right place to be. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I've, um, so I've been, I've known you since I think we've, I've been working for you guys at the Harrisburg Outdoor Show since, I don't know, 2016 or 17. Yeah, somewhere in there. I go back and really chart it out. Yeah, yeah, somewhere in there. It's been, it's been quite a while. So that's, it's, uh, I've known you guys for a while and getting to see, especially when we'd work the booth and, and see the, the people that would come through and, you know, start by who, who are you guys, you know, and then the next year, Oh, you know, I was, I was here last year talking to you and, and just keeps kind of snowballing. And, you know, a lot of the reason for that is with, if anybody hasn't heard of Maven, I'm going to have Cade give a, a little, uh little 
elevator pitch on uh, the company. But if you've listened to just about any of my introductions to the podcast, you've heard me talk about uh, a, a brief couple line discussion about Maven. But would you like to give a little bit about the brand and the business model? Sure. Yeah, you know, um, we started in July of 2013. Uh, all of us come from previous places within the um, outdoor industry, but we had uh, an expertise and a passion in optics. And the one thing we knew is we want didn't want to do it the same way everybody else had been doing it. Um, and so, you know, we kind of batted it around literally around the campfire at uh, Brendan's house. He has a big backyard fire pit where a lot of our good ideas and a fair amount of bad ideas have come up. <laughs> um, and this idea of doing a direct consumer business model, um, you know, really, really took root, you know, it let us do a really premium product uh, and compete against the big European brands and quality but by cutting out the sales reps and the, and the dealers and distributors and everyone that wants to take a little bit of cut of your money, we are able to put out a very, very high level product at a much more uh, reasonable price. And um, it's not a fast growth model. You know, the fastest way to grow is to dump uh, 20 containers at Cabela's every couple of weeks and then let them sell them for you. Uh, but what we are seeing is a very natural organic growth. Uh, people are appreciating the value that uh, that they're able to get and still get a premium product. And you know, we have a, a lot of loyal uh, customers, a lot of loyal fans, people who gave us a shot six years ago, really kind of um, taking a gamble on a new company. And now they email us and they have eight and 10 products and they're buying three for Christmas for their friends. And, it, it it's the payoff's been really good, but it's been, you know, we talked about meeting at shows uh, two years ago, which was our last really full show schedule. I believe uh, between the people here at the office and some pro staff uh, and uh, some contract uh, friends of ours that have done some shows for us, I think we were represented at 43 shows in 2019. Um, that's a grind. That's that's getting out there, putting the product in someone's hand. They can't go to Cabela's and pick it up and compare it to the other brands and optics counter. So um, they have to be able to either see it at a show or do it through our demo program. Or so it, it's been a long road to hoe, and we're definitely still just we're a small little startup compared to some of the big giants, but we're doing well and we're having fun with it. So. Yeah, I've, I've definitely noticed the loyal following that you guys have. It's almost like a, a cult-like following of people that just really love the products and love the the brand and seeing it grow that way. And and yeah, and that's what that's what I was getting at when I was talking about the, being at shows where people were like, I, I've never seen this before because they're used to going into a box store and seeing some of the other main you know brands and companies. But even in the smog-filled uh arena at the great american outdoor show from the we always set up near the the food stations with all the grease that's going up into the the ceilings you could still they were still very impressed by looking through the the optics and and i'd i bought my first pair and it wasn't 20 2017 yeah it was in 2017 was the first year that i used them out west on my hunts and it was just and now I I have a lot more products of your guys, but it was it was great to see the the expansion even in the product lines too because it started relatively small and focused and started growing and expanding and getting along there. So that was that was pretty pretty cool to be able to to see that. So and you also have another option. So other than shows, which right now aren't really happening to be able to get your hands on the optics as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about the demo program? Yeah, our demo program is super popular and um, there, there's two pieces that make it really important to us. The fact that you can't go to a, a store and pick it up is one. And two is that a store is still not the best place to look at optics. The best place to look at optics is where you use optics. And so, we have a program where basically you get on our website, you 
buy a gently used optic from us at, uh, I think it's 5% off or something. It comes unpackaged and everything, but it comes with a return label. And the intent isn't that you're purchasing this. It's just, we can't send you a thousand dollar optic without a pretty solid uh, deposit on it. Um, and you take it out for a drive. You, you go out to where you glass for animals, you take it out last light, take it out at first light and really see how it perform, performs in your environment. And I, I always recommend that people call their buddies that have the, every other possible brand they're considering and get them out there with them. You know, get our demo and their buddies, Swaro and their other buddies, Vortex, and just line them all up and take a look at them and see, see what you think and see where you, you feel that we land within that. Uh, figure out if uh, we're the right value proposition for what you're looking for. Um, most people that demo end up buying a unit. They either keep the demo or they send it back and buy a custom unit. We, um, a lot of times, I guess we do have someone who will take two demos. They want to compare the B110 versus the B29 uh, just in real world scenarios. And we'll talk about those numbers more a little bit later, uh, but they might get two of them so they can get a real world scenario difference between what will work for them size wise, field of view wise, all that. But it's a great way to, to uh, really look through the optic and use it the way you would in your everyday life, because it's, it's an investment. It's not a small thing. It's not running to the grocery store for a loaf of bread. Um, even if you're doing very, very well at an engineering firm, um, you still got to monitor your, uh, nickels and dimes so you can still go on that big hunt in the fall or whatever. So um, it's, we, we believe in it. We believe in our product and we're happy to let people take a look through them. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, I think that's awesome that they can do that and, and choose to either keep them or send them back. And it, the, the custom optics that you do is very unique. And uh, I, I think that's, I mean, I know I love going on the custom builder on the website and, building things out and you can change just about any component on those and make them, you know, hundred percent unique to your own, it, you know, your set will look a lot different than anybody else's essentially. And I, I think that's a, that's a, another cool add on feature that, that you guys have and are able to do because of that direct to consumer business model. Yeah. That's never going to work at a big gift counter at a, at a big store. They're not going to run in the back and slap a pair together for you. The fact that we're selling them one at a time, we're building them one at a time, gives us some flexibility. Yeah. And it gives you, again, like I said, it's an investment. So making that investment personal to you is a little cool, you know, a little cooler, makes it uh, feel a little more personal. Yeah. And one of the things about optics that I've learned over the last five years is that I learned very quickly how important they were on Western hunts and in spending time behind them. And, but what I didn't realize was how much I would use those for whitetail hunting is, well, I have those, the, as again, we'll get into the details of them, but the little B three, uh, eight by thirties. And I have those around my neck all the time. It saves my legs when I'm shed hunting, when I see a stick across the, uh, the valley and which 95% of the time it's a stick instead of a shed, instead of having to go over there, I can take a look at it. And, and also just having them around my neck when I'm whitetail hunting, even when it's in the, the thicker woods. Cause what I've found with using, um, your optics specifically is that even when the light gets lower, you're having trouble seeing with your naked eye, I'm it brings more light when I'm looking through uh, the binoculars or spotting scope or whatever it is than even looking at normal. And that was, that was probably the most mind blowing thing to me. I, I had a, I had a video I'd show when we'd be at the, the show when someone was looking at uh, they're like, well, what, you know, you were explaining the technical terms um, about the, the B2s and explaining why they're great in low light. And I'm like, here, let me just show you what they actually do. And I had that video where I spoke, looked outside and it was basically dark out. And then I scrolled back over to my phone, my other phone that was on a, a phone scope hooked up to it. And it was bright. It looked like it was daylight looking through to some elk up in the high country. And that was, that was pretty neat. Yeah. It amazes me how many whitetail hunters I talk to that say they don't use optics in, in their stands uh, because um, 
I don't, I haven't hunted a lot in tree stands, uh, but I've gone a few times now. Uh, it's getting, getting a little better since my last debacle that we talked about on our previous uh, podcast. Yeah. But, you know, I'm, I'm sitting up in a tree stand in uh, Kansas, uh, which I know isn't Eastern whitetail hunting, but it's still down in the timber. It's still whitetail hunting. It's different than, or not timber down in the river bottoms with a bunch of cottonwoods and everything. And, you know, I would see a, a little buck coming in and I could see, just see a little bit of motion with my naked eye and I'd pull up my, uh, my B threes and get looking and I could see another buck following them in, or I could watch a doe moving and see motion that I could never pick with my naked eye. And it gave me that couple of minute advantage of going, okay, dear, cause you, unless you're much, uh, I mean, you are stronger than I am, but unless you're much stronger than I am, you're not standing up a full draw in the right position all the time, every time. You've got to, it, the deer's coming from the right, deer's coming from the left. You've got to get situated. The more heads up you have about where the action's going to come from, to me, it gives you that much more opportunity to be prepared for a good shot, a, a good decision on which animal, you know, what they're going to do. And to me, if you can buy two minutes of time on an animal coming in, so you can move while they're still far enough out to not disturb them. Um, it's, it's irreplaceable. I mean, that's the difference between getting a shot off and not getting a shot off. Uh, and so why you wouldn't take every tool in the field with you that you can to give yourself an advantage in a tough situation blows my mind. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I think is a misconception is you think of just having to be open to use optics as far as more open country. And, and what I've found is even when I'm in these thicker logging cuts and stuff, you don't everything is just like intertwined. You got blackberry briars and all these things together. But when I'm constantly sitting in the tree, kind of glassing and looking around, you catch movement that you wouldn't see with your naked eyes, something slipping through or, or doing anything And that. And that alone, it helps keep your mind in the game rather than just sitting there and looking around because you'll get lazy with it pretty quick. So by being able to to pick it up and look through things. I don't know. I just, I've found a, a big advantage to it that I, I felt like I was missing out on in the, in the past with it. So that's just uh, one of the things I, I would say, but uh, the, what I want to get into here first is, is Kate is I, I want to go through the different types of optics and you know, what makes those quality, you know, what would be considered quality, what kind of features make it that way. Um, understanding some of those features and then how to choose the right thing for your application. So to start off, I wanted to start with binoculars. So what, this is a very open-ended question here, but what makes a quality binocular? The biggest factor in binoculars is glass. Um, just having glass is a big first step. If you spend 50 bucks at a, a big box chain store in your neighborhood, you're probably not getting much glass. It's probably mostly going to be polished plastic lenses. Um, you know, one of the first things you've worked our booth, uh, first thing people come and they pick up our, one of our B1 10 by 42s and go, wow, that that's pretty heavy. Yeah, that's what makes it good. It's got all this glass in it. It's got a lot of lens elements. Each time that light touches a lens, every time it hits that glass, is an opportunity for us to do something with that image. Uh, make it brighter, make it clearer, make it cleaner, right? So glass is important. Bad glass is bad, good glass is good, more glass is good up to a certain point. Like it's 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 a it's a recipe. Yeah. You know, if you're baking a cake. You have to have just the right amount of salt. And if you put too much salt in it, it's ruined. But if you don't have enough of your other ingredients, you know, it, it's all got to work together. It's a system. Um, so the optics system kind of works together. And, and the, the two main ingredients within a binocular per se is a prism and all of the lens elements. And the lens elements are, you know, they magnify, they focus the light on the next lens element to transmit it through. And then the prism, one of the things a prism does, if you've ever looked through those old telescopes that didn't have prisms, you'd look and it was flipped upside down. It's part of the erection image and makes it look uh, right side up. 
Um, and then it, it controls that light. And instead of needing something, um, you know, two feet long to get that image correct to your eye, it basically bends that light around in a little tiny circle inside and helps you get it in a much smaller package. So the prism shortens the optical system and then the lenses, and I'm not an optical engineer. I'm sure there's going to be someone out there going, you missed this important point. And I, I apologize. I'm, I'm not <laughs> that smart. Uh, I can only pass on what I know, which isn't much, but uh, <laughs> the, the lenses are important. And so then you take the lens itself, the glass. Now, if you shine a flashlight on your window or on your mirror, or on your computer screen right here, you'll notice that it gets bright behind you because that light reflects. So then you've got to start working on your coatings. The natural state of glass is to reflect light and we want to transmit light. We want to pass it through that lens. So um, one of the things you'll hear in optics is you'll hear about coated, fully, fully multi-coated, fully coated. All of those things mean something slightly different. So when you cut that lens, it's a little bit of, you know, cause that's how you cut the glass or how you get it that shape as you cut it. Then you polish it, you get it as smooth as possible, um, which that technology has come a long way in 20 years. It's really automated now. It's not people sitting around in a circle with a, a little bit of slurry on a, on a stick trying to get it just perfect. It's a much more automated system. And then the, the coatings start getting applied. And a, if, it, if you look at a box and it doesn't say, if you look at specs and it doesn't say anything about coatings, it's uncoated. They're just in there and it's probably getting 65, 70 tops light transmission because it's not putting any, it's reflecting a bunch of light. The next step is fully coated. It means that each um, primary lens element has at least one coating. Fully multi-coated, which is what every optic we make has, has is fully multi-coated. It means that every lens element has up to 32 coatings on. So, you know, that's everything from coatings that help manage color to coatings that help manage light to uh, coatings the ones that actually touch the air surface of the ocular and objective lenses, the one for, towards your eye and one towards the object you're looking at. Those have hydrophobic and oil phobic coatings on them, scratch resistant coatings, just, and those things add up. So, you know, that's what you're getting for your difference between a hundred dollar binocular and a thousand dollar binocular is you're getting more glass. You're getting a better grade of glass. You're getting more attention to polishing and you're getting all of those coatings that help make sure that that image that hits your eye is the best it could possibly be. And this isn't unique to Maven. This isn't brand specific. This is an industry-wide standard. So if you're a fan of you know any of our competitors out there, that's fine. This information holds true across the board. Yeah. No, I, I think that's I think that's super helpful. And and I I uh, never realized until I started working with you and you were teaching me these things as we were as I'd be there hanging out with you and, and learning it. And there's so much that goes into it that just, I had no idea. So, all right. So here's a, a common misconception that I've heard people say, and I was one of the ones that said that from the beginning is what is the, what is ED glass and what do people consider as HD glass? I know you love this one. So that's why I, I want to bring it up. One. I love it. And this one is where I will get a little bit more specific about our brand versus others. Um, one thing we set out to do at day one is we try to be incredibly straightforward. We don't name our coatings. We don't trademark little quirky things within our optics that really um, don't add value, but add cost. Um, and to be fair, we're not trying to compete in a display case with 30 other brands where we have to stand out with something like that. So it's nothing against our, our competitors. It's just something we've chose to do differently. And so we tend to use industry terms. We tend to use exact um, technical phrasing from our engineering and manuf manufacturing team. And we don't try to dress it up at all. Um, ED stands for extra load dispersion glass. It's a very, very dense glass. 
um, and the dents becomes important. The density of glass, sorry, UPS is picking up right now, so it got a little noisy. Um, <laughs> the density of glass, the denser it is, the less refraction of light happens as it goes through it. So as it, if it's really, really thick and dense glass, when the beam of light hits it, it goes straight through it versus bending and you lose some light when it bends through and it can cause some color splits and color shift as light gets bent. So you want a good, thick, dense, heavy glass. ED is an industry term and is a standard term. If you say your binocular has ED glass, it has to contain technical ED engineered glass. So you take it to the next step and you say HD. Well, if you look across the board, if you look at all of our other competitors, most use HD somewhere in one of their product lines. And typically people refer, think it's high definition. Most of the time they're referring to high density, which would equal extra low dispersion, which is a high density glass. The phrase HD itself, high definition, doesn't have any baseline standards to it except in electronics. And these aren't electronics. It's not, you know, we're not talking about pixels per inch or anything here. We're talking about a, an image to your eye. So if you say HD, there is no requirement whatsoever to what you put in your binocular. And um, one of our competitors, they have two HD lines. And I haven't looked lately to see if this has changed, but this was true a couple of years ago. They had two HD lines. One had ED glass and one did not have ED glass. So um, it just goes to show it, it's a marketing term. Yeah. It's, it's, we like to use phrasing that when the a customer hears it, sees it, or reads it, they don't have to go another step to research what it means. You know, um, it's like with the trademarked uh, coatings. You know, they're they're changing the fraction of one chemical in there by 0.01%, making it their own proprietary coating. But I don't think the general consumer goes, oh, well, that, you know, extra 0.1% of uh, aluminum oxide really, you know, that that's really making that deer pop. Um, it's a differentiator. Um, you know, I'm sure sometimes our PR guys are like, you know, can't you just give us one little fancy thing we can we can talk about? But, you know, <laughs> it starts with our naming conventions, you know, our B series. I was like, oh, what's your A series? Well, there isn't because binocular starts with B and so it's our B series. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't spend a lot of time on our naming conventions. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's funny. Uh, that's, yeah, the way all of yours are kind of named that way. But, um, so the, the next thing is magnification and field of view and how those kind of correlate together. Can you give me a little bit on, I, I feel like, again, this is from my experience of working the shows, everyone comes up and it's not everyone, but a lot of people come up and just say, I want a 10 by 42 without really knowing what that means. Yep. Um, so we'll start with the numbers, the magnification numbers. Um, and how they tie in to the, the big picture. So the first number is the magnification, 10X, 10 times. You know, when they see that 10X42, that X is actually reference to the first number, the 10 times magnification. It means whatever you see, if you look at it with your naked eye and then you put up the monocular, it's going to look 10 times closer, 10 times bigger. Um, so if you have a deer at a thousand yards, when you put up the binoculars, it's gonna look like it's a hundred yards away. Just that easy, it's easy math. Um, the second number is the size of the objective end the, uh, and the points at your target in millimeters. So it has a 42 millimeter diameter lens. Uh, 10 by 42 is the single most popular size of binocular in the United States. Um, it's a good workhorse optic uh, frame. Um, you know, if you get on any of the forums, many people will swear it's, it is the only appropriate uh, size for a binocular. 
it has its limitations, but it has its advantages and kind of depends on what your usage is. Um, and you've been around us long enough to know that almost everyone at our company uh, leans towards a lower power binocular. Um, and the pieces of that, that, you know, you asked about field of view, there's, there's a lot of different metrics that come out of a, a binocular. Um, some of them are a direct derivative of that magnification by objective lens. Uh, the number one of those is exit pupil. And exit pupil, you know, it sounds all scientific and stuff, but it's the beam of light that comes out of the binocular that, that exits the binocular and hits your pupil. Like it's that beam of light at the end. And it is strictly mathematical. It's the same for a $10 toy pair of binoculars and a $4,000 pair of European binoculars. You divide the objective lens by the magnification. And so for a 10 by 42, it's 4.2 millimeters. Very easy math. And it, so, you know, people will be like, oh, you know, I, I want a bigger exit pupil, so I'm going to pay more money for a higher end. You know, it is no indication of quality. It's strictly a mathematical formula for how big of a beam of light will come out of the end of your binocular. Um, a bigger exit pupil um, does a couple of things for you. Um, it delivers more light to your eye. Um, but more importantly, it gives you a more forgiving sight window. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes I see made is uh, they, you give a kid a pair of binoculars. and then, Dad, I want a pair of binoculars to go hunting with you. Great. So they go to Walmart and see what they have on the shelf. And they've got a pair of, you know, $25, 12 by 25 sitting on the shelf. Um, mostly plastic lenses, pretty poor quality, but you know, it's a kid. What, what are they going to do? So they grab that and they, they buy it and they go out hunting with the kid and the kid can't use them, can't get them to work, can't get them to line up with their eyes. Well, each one of those is only putting out about two millimeters of light to the eye, meaning to get a full view out of that binocular, you have to have it perfectly aligned to both your eyes. That hinge has to be bent just right. You really have to line it up. And what it does is it leads to frustration. Um, and so what I like to do with uh, when I go out with kids, I'll give them a six by 30, which is a nice small light binocular, gives them some nice magnification, six times magnification, still really solid, but it gives them a five millimeter exit pupil. There's a lot of forgiveness in that uh, binocular. If they put it up, they're going to see something through it. It's gonna be much easier to see. Um, that's also the binocular I recommend for anyone that has any kind of shake or jitter. We have some Parkinson uh, customers that use it because the magnification magnifies motion as well, right? So having a low magnification kind of takes that tremor out a little bit. It makes it a little easier to hold if you're shaky, has a bigger, real big field of view. Um, so, so that's one of the things that exit pupil is pretty important. Field of view is a little deceptive. Field of view is rarely, not rarely, it is tied to magnification, but nine different 10 by 42s are gonna have nine different fields of view. Um, it depends on your prism angle set, depends on the length of your barrels that you're using, your optical system. All of those things kind of factor in. If you take the exact same model, so our B3, that we do in three powers. We have it in a 10 by 30, eight by 30 and six by 30. As you decrease the field of uh, the power, you get a bigger field of view within that. So uh, it's just adjusting the cone, um, the cone that comes from the edge of the binocular looking out into the binocular, looking out into eternity, basically at an angle, uh, a fixed amount of degrees leaves that uh, the light, coming into that or, you know, the cone leaving it is fixed at a degree. And then at a thousand yards, you mark it. And that's what your field of view is. By having a shorter power range in there, it widens that cone. And so it gives you a bigger field of view. Um, and so you can get a bigger field of view by decreasing your power. Um, the other thing that that does, there's light everywhere that you look, even at night, even at the very last thing of 
evening. And when you tighten your field of view in, you eliminate not only real estate, you're seeing less stuff, but the light, the ambient light in those areas don't come into your binocular. And so a higher power binocular will always look darker than a lower power binocular because there's less ambient light because it's seeing less property. Yeah, no, and th that that makes sense. And because Kade, that that was, yeah, again, one of the things that I learned the most and the, the two different binos that I have from you guys are I have the eight by 30 and then I have a nine by 45 and like the nine by 45, I chose that mostly because of your guys' influence a little bit on that as far as for elk hunting and, and doing things. But like I've at the time I was hunting mostly timber and I, since then I've been, I've hunted Alaska with them. It was wide open in the tundra and hunted high country that was, you know, a, a lot more open and I still don't, I, I still like that lower magnification because of that field of view and being able to, it brings so much light in that you can, you can glass up to, you know, pass where you could even legally shoot and still be able to see through it. And for me, that was a really, a really big selling point. Yeah. I like that nine by 45. It's still my go-to optic for 90% of what I do. It's just we have higher magnifications. You know, we sell a lot more of the 11s than we do the nine. But yeah, for my money, the nine by 45 is just one of the best binoculars out there. Yeah. So with, with that being said, let's just briefly go through the B series line that that you have and the the different different ones that you have and what kind of their purpose is is built for, if if you would. Sure. And so our B series. The, the numbering system is slightly nonsensical. It's in the order that we launched them. And so there isn't a huge, you can't go, okay, you know, the B1's better than the B2 or the B3 is bigger than the B5. There's, there is no logic to it other than when we release a new binocular, we tack the next number on it and we move on. So, there, there's that creative um, uh, uh, naming system again. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it, sometimes it comes back to be more complex in its simplicity, but so our B1, our first binocular we put out is an, a 10 by 42 and eight by 42. Uh, typically when you divide, uh, develop an optical system, you can go a couple of power uh, ranges within it and not, not tax the system too much. So you'll hear us talk about, or you'll hear me talk about them with multiple powers within the same chassis. So the B1 chassis, typical, uh, eight and 10 by 42, really uh, spectacular optic. Um, one of our more compact full-size units. So for smaller framed people or you know, people that really want a small chest harness or whatever, it, it's a good full-size optic. Uh, uses a traditional roof prism, schmidt Peschen roof prism. Um, the B2, uh, I kind of consider that our, the flagship of our line. It comes in seven, nine, and 11 power. Uh, it's, it uses a newer prism system called an abaconing. It has less reflective surfaces in it, and they're all at the same angle. So it really lets a lot of light through, and you have to manipulate the light less to get it through correctly. So it gives you a really, really brilliant, clear image. Uh, that's the binocular that won Field and Stream's Best of the Best in Optics a few years ago. It continues to do really well in... Uh, in reviews, head-to-head -head reviews against, you know, some of the biggest names in the industry. The B3 is our compact within our um, premium line, our B series. It's a, a 30 millimeter objective. We do it in six, eight, and 10 power. Uh, real nice and compact. To me, it's, you know, one of the most versatile optics. It's one that you should always have with you. You've heard me say this in the booth a million times, but the best optic you have is the one you have with you. Um, and a lot of people, especially more casual, like wildlife watchers or hikers, tend to leave their full-size binoculars home because they just don't, they're not an essential tool for their activity. Then they get out there a couple of miles from the trailhead and they see an elk or a deer or something they want to get a, a look at. And they're like, oh, I wish I had my binoculars with me. With the B3, there's no reason not to take them. They're under a pound. They're brilliant glass. They're, you should always have them in your backpack or in your purse or in your fanny pack out east or whatever. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> nice job. <laughs> uh, our B4, um, the B4 was our first uh, big 56 millimeter, still a really good optic, also an Abaconig uh, prism. Uh, it It's a dual hinge instead of a single hinge, so it looks a little bit bulkier. Uh, it has some interesting eyepieces to it. Some people absolutely love them. Some people absolutely hate it. It almost has a uh, spotting scope style eyepiece to it. So some, uh, especially larger nose or narrow eye folks tend to not love the B4s. Uh, we still sell a fair amount really to guides. Guides love them. And they're great on a tripod. Uh, but it led us to launch the B5. And the B5 is also a 56 millimeter. 10, 12, 15, and 18 power in the B5. And it's based almost, if you look at them close, you can tell that they're based directly off our B2 chassis. Um, they share a lot of components. They're, they're built to be that just absolute top of the line. And I don't know if there's a 56 millimeter in the market that competes. I mean, they are fluorite glass. So instead of ED glass, uh, they actually have fluorite, which is a man-made monocrystal. Uh, it's very expensive and tough to work with, but on a large objective, anything over about 55, it is just spectacular uh, objective lens glass. It lets you have a really short uh, color color throw uh, because of the way the crystal is made. The light transmits through it in a really pure fashion. Uh, we use it in everything, all of our binoculars and spotting scopes over 50 millimeters. Um, in our B, B and S so, line. So with, with those B fives, like what would be the application, the type of hunt that you would be on that those would be the most useful or that people would prefer them? So out West, especially mule deer hunters, um, they do what they call grid glassing. They sit down on a ridge and they look at a ridge across, you know, that could be a mile away and they, walk that binoc they put it on a tripod they sit down on a hill and they walk that binocular across a field of view and then when they get to the end of the ridge they lower it a couple inches go back and they're looking under every bush every, under every tree they're looking for a tip of horn sticking up from behind a sagebrush that a buck's bedded down so that they can spot him and make a move before he gets up and starts moving and so that really long, extensive glassing. Um, you've, you've been out West hunting elk, you know, that, uh, sitting up on a ridge and watching meadows on neighboring, neighboring hillsides, trying to catch the first glimpse of a, a bull coming out, or maybe he's just gonna just skim the edge of it and not even fully come out into the meadow, but might just stick his head out for a minute for a graze, that kind of glassing where looking through a single eye spotting scope can get tiring. Um, a lot of people prefer a, a binocular on a tripod for that really intensive hours long glassing. Gotcha. So, all right. So that kind of rounds out the B series of the binos. As far as the C series go more, more, I'd be more, uh, inclined to ask you about the, what the C series means more than the specific sizes that you have. Yeah. Yeah. I, I won't, uh, dwell too much on the C series. C stands for classic. Um, so it's our classic line. It more mimics some of our competitors' lines as far as offering. You know, it's, it kind of parallels what people are used to buying instead of getting crazy with the 11 by 45s and stuff. Um, but our our goal there was to provide, again, you know, provide that value. But even with a direct consumer model, a $900 binocular is not not a inconsequential purchase, and you know, the, the fact of the matter is we realized we were losing lifelong customers because what happens is your first binocular, you go out and buy it. You probably got gifted a $50 binocular when you were 18. You use that for a couple of years and you're ready to make your next big purchase of your first real binocular. Um, and you have a budget between two and $500. Yes, you would love to get into the thousand, $2,000 range, but you're just not there yet, but you're hunting hard enough. You need that next tier. And so you go and you buy that next step and 80% of people will never go past that step. But if they do, a lot of people stay loyal, like 
I really like this and this and this about this company. I'm, I'm riding for the brand. Now I'm ready to upgrade. I upgrade within the line. And so we realized we were missing some customers in that mid price point who might eventually in five, 10 years be our next tier up. But we still wanted to provide a really solid value optic. Um, so we launched our C series and you know traditional eight and 10 by 42 and 10 and 12 by 50. Uh, and we do really, really well with it. And most people, I'd say 80% of consumers, that's where that's where they'll end up. They'll probably never jump from there. Um, but it comes in packaged from the Philippines. You know, we don't package it here. Um, it, it comes in ready to go from the Philippines. Um, it's not customizable like all of our B series is. It has a little less glass, a little less coatings. You know, our B series is uh, all the components come out of Japan. We do final assembly in the U.S. The C series again, we're doing that bulk production in the Philippines. So it's just some of the some of those trade offs you get. Uh, but I mean, for three hundred and fifty dollars on this C one ten by forty two. It, it compares against optics at twice that price. Yeah, no. And, and, um, and they're also, uh, you know, a, a little bit lighter, uh, lighter weight too, because of the less, I'm, I'm maybe speaking on turn here, but the less glass and also is a different, um, outer shell or however you yeah, want Because it has less glass, it can have a plastic frame, a polymer frame, um, when you have a lot of glass, uh, the, that weight will flex a plastic hinge and take them out of alignment. And so you need a metal body, which adds more weight. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so you, you have to have the heavy body to deal with the heavy glass. But if you get rid of some glass, you can go with a lighter body. And so that entire package becomes lighter, which I mean, the 1042s, the, the C ones are, are great, great glass. And, if you don't put them side by side with the the big boys, they're they're great. You know, there's no complaints about them. Um, but if you're ready for that little bit more, the B series, yeah, carry the day. So, all right, let's let's jump into spotting scopes next. Right, I'm going to go quick on spotting scopes because I, I see our time is time is moving along quickly, yeah. and the spotting scope conversation is the binocular conversation, Yep. Um, the glasses, the materials, the lenses, uh, really a similar thing. There are a couple of points I want to make. Um, we're unique in that we do a 25 to 50 by 80. And it's a, a zoom scope. It goes from 25 power to 50 power. And, you know, we've won some awards with it. And one of the awards we won within the um, review basically said this thing is spectacular from 25 to 50. We wished it went to 60 because of how good it is. And what they fail to realize is it's so good because it doesn't do the 20 to 60. Um, the way magnification works on a zoom is it's a X times zoom, right? So 25 to 50, that is a two times zoom. All of that zoom happens in the eyepiece of the, the spotting scope. A three time zoom, which is a 20 to 60, puts 50% more strain on that optical system by increasing that, uh, that zoom window. And you talk to people that have 20 to 60s, they say, well, I almost never use it on 20 because it's not quite enough. And I almost never use it on 60 because it's awful. So we worked with the, our optical engineer, like where is the maximum performance? Where can we go? And we could have gone probably 30 to 60 and still done fairly well. Although a 60 by 80, that um, exit pupil is only 1.2. That's really, really hard to look through, right? So by lowering that magnification, it makes the entire zoom range usable and really, really bright. Um, and we know we lose some customers to people that's like, oh, I got to have 80 on my top end. You know, how often do you use 80? Never can't see through it, but I got it because it's powerful. Yeah. Okay. You know, that, it's everyone has specific uses, and some people do need that max power. Uh, we're not for everybody. We know that, but we really designed that scope. It doesn't matter if you're using it on the low end or the high end, it is really, really good. So 
we we intentionally made some sacrifices to convention in order to, to make it work, uh, but we did it on purpose. Um, then the other one that I just want to hit on real quick is the S two. The S two is uh, it's it's my my baby, my brainchild. I know I said Mike was the spotting scope uh, product manager, but this was a product I brought to my partners, and it's because. I had an S1 and I would uh, get to elk camp in the morning or get up in the morning, start packing my pack. And I'd look over at that tripod and that spotting scope sitting there and be like, mm, yeah, I'm not taking that today. Then I'd go out hiking for a couple hours and see an elk or think I saw an elk and get set up on a ridge. I'm like, crap, I wish I had a spotting scope with me. Get back to camp, committed that I'm going to take it. And I'm like, eh, I'm not carrying that out there. It's too big. And I just wanted something to pick up where my binoculars left off, right? You know, I carry a nine power binocular. It's great for spotting, great for uh, picking up motion. And sometimes you want to know, you know, I'm, I'm a big dude. You, you've seen me. I'm, I'm, I'm not making it very quick that two miles to, to check out that next bull. If I'm going to haul my fat butt over there. I, I want to know that, uh, that it's worth it. So I just want to be able to throw something up, take a look and make sure it's worth it. And so that's two was a brainchild of, you know, being able to keep it in a water bottle pocket and throw it, not even need a tripod, throw it on your backpack or throw it over a tree limb and really get that extra, extra look at something. And I fought for two years with my partners and uh, with uh, our uh, development team. And we were like, you know what? Uh, finally convinced them that it was worth giving it a shot. And we did a limited run. We only made 200 of them. And we launched it and we sold out in 22 days. Yeah, that's, well, that, that's incredible. I mean, that, that S2 is the one that I have and that I use, I like it because it's so light for backpack hunts or just about anything. Cause it, it's like you said, it fits in a water bottle pocket, um, I love that little, that little spotting scope, 12 to 27, um, power and, and by 56. I mean, it's, it fit the, the bill for me when that, when you guys launched that, I was like, that is what I need in my, in my kit. Yeah. And again, it's not for everybody. You know, we have a lot of people that, that would be great if it was a 60 power, like, well, a 60 by 56 is going to be pretty un, <laughs> unusable, but I understand what you're looking for, you know? Everyone has their their own personal needs, but this uh, it fits a, a niche, and we're okay. We're small enough; we can make some niche products, uh, and and it's done really well. And then we just launched the CS1 uh, spotting scope this fall. Uh, again, back in that kind of traditional, um, more traditional zoom range, um, fifteen to forty five by. 60, I think. Yeah, uh, by 65. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Too many products now. I'm starting to lose my brain a little bit. And it's at 650 bucks. That thing is crushing it. It is it is a tremendous scope. So if you like that a little bit bigger traditional zoom range in a compact spotting scope, it it's a it crushes it. Well, I was I took that to Alaska with me and I was glass and caribou at just over four miles away on the, the ridge and it was it did incredible for, I, you know, I, I guess I didn't know what to expect. I guess I should have expected it was going to be great. And then my buddy had bought the S1, the S1A. And um, so he had the 25 to 50 by 80. And and you, there, was a, there was a noticeable difference at, at, there was a noticeable difference. But if I wouldn't line them up next to each other, you wouldn't at all. And I, I don't know. I, I was very happy with that, that C series uh, on that uh, spotting scope though. I, I definitely enjoyed it. Yep. They're, they're pretty sweet. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, the next thing I want to transition to is a little bit different, which is rifle scopes. And this is in your product line a little bit, right? Yep. Okay. So yeah, uh, rifle scopes, uh, rifle scopes are fun because they are so personal. Um, the, the rifle scope usage is, it, it takes up so much more of our customer service time than binoculars, even though it's such a smaller portion of our business. 
because there's there's a fundamental um, I won't say lack of understanding, but there's due to some questionable marketing in the past by other companies that aren't around anymore, um, and just some understand or uh, some assumptions that people make. Sometimes you have to explain to people that what they think they know, they don't know. And that's, that's not a, always a great conversation. Um, but rifle scopes are amazing because, you know, my dad who I went hunting with, he had a three to nine by 40 Bushnell on every gun that uh, he shot and he killed deer and elk every year, always, you know, hundred, 150 yards. I don't think I ever saw my dad take a shot over 150 yards, even at the range. Like that, that just wasn't what he did. And he never adjusted a click, never adjusted a dial. But when you did go sight it in, he tapped on the side to get it to settle in, you know, all those funny little quirks of, of older scopes. Uh, but technology has come so far um, that it's, that it's hard to get a bad rifle scope. If you spend, you know, a few hundred dollars or more, um, then you're really starting to talk about features and things that you want and what you like. The biggest jump that's happened in the last few years has been the different, it has been the growth of the first focal plane reticle. Um, and this leads to huge amounts of confusion and a huge amount of frustration if you're not familiar with it, but basically almost every scope you've looked through to this point in your life, unless you're an active shooter, actively growing your collection has been a second focal plane. What that means is the reticle is behind the zoom mechanism instead of in front. So as you zoom, your image gets bigger, but your reticle stays exactly the same. A first focal plane, which some people call a front focal plane, is because the reticle is in front of the zoom mechanism. So as you zoom, the image and the reticle changes size at the same time and in the same proportion. The advantage, so the disadvantage, which I'll hit first, is that the reticle gets bigger and looks different no matter what zoom you're on. So as you change it, it looks different. And... <clears throat> That can be frustrating to some people. They feel like it blocks out more of the image when it uh, zooms in. Um, it actually, I believe, blocks out the exact same amount of image. It just because of the way the image has changed. But the, the big advantage and where it really makes a difference is holdovers. If you have holdovers in your reticle and you are used to holding over, your holdovers are only accurate at one magnification on a second focal plane. So someone has arbitrarily picked what power is the set holdovers. And most of the time it's max power, but if it's a big zoom, like uh, four to 24, for example, you're probably not gonna use it on 24 all that often. So you set it at 12, that's where the reticle is accurate. The five MOA, 10 MOA, holdovers. But if you go to 24, those holdovers have doubled their value. If you go down to six, those have halved their value. So what you've calculated for your drop, if you use those same holdovers at 400 yards, you're, you're six, eight inches off. You're outside of a kill zone. You're hitting under an animal. You're shooting over an animal. We're on a first focal plane. Whatever you calculate your drop to be, it doesn't matter if you're on two power or 30 power, it is the exact same drop. That's the advantage. They're a little more expensive to make because that timing of that mechanism to make everything zoom at the same ratio uh, is, you know, involves technology and everything. So they're a little more expensive, but um, they, if you're going to use your reticle to shoot, you should have a first focal plane scope. Okay, yeah, that 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 makes a a lot of sense. And and in your line, what is it? All of them except for one uh, first focal plane. Yeah. When do you plan on putting this uh, podcast up? Um, 
in probably in two weeks. Okay. So yes. <laughs> the RS one, three, and four are first focal plane. The RS two, which is our ultralight two to ten by thirty eight, is the second focal plane. Um, we do have intention of launching another second focal plane. Okay, gotcha. And is that okay to release that, or do I need to cut that out? <laughs> nope, that's, that's I, I said what I said. Okay, all right. Just wanted to make sure. Um, yeah, because the the rifle scope that I used this year was the RS two, which is the the second focal plane yep. one. I I chose that because of its lightweight platform, and it goes down to two power for whitetail hunting, um, and just. And I, I used it up in Alaska for caribou hunting. And then I also used it that here, I, you know, I think that there could have been a, a better scope for the caribou hunt for the, for the purpose of be sh being able to shoot long range. Um, but at the same time, it was a perfect for me knowing I was going to hunt whitetails more. So instead of having a bunch of different scopes, I have, you know, I had bought a gun that was kind of a compromise for it and the same, you know, same yep. thing goes for it, but yeah. So, you know, and that RS2, that's what I have on my primary hunting gun because we had a friend of ours build us an ultralight mountain rifle. And it's ridiculous to put a three pound scope on top of a six and a half pound gun. Yeah. That's the entire purpose. So, we designed that uh, RS2 to be one of the lightest uh, full zoom scopes on the market. And it, you know, it's 11 and a half ounces. It's absolutely brilliant for those kind of guns. If you're going to hike a few miles into the backcountry or more, it's, it's the scope to have, but I don't have it on my thousand yard AR 10 that I take up to the range. Yeah. RS four comes in. So each, each scope kind of has their purposes and you've got to, you know, one of the questions you'd thrown to me earlier is how do you choose the right one for your application? Yep. And the first thing you need to do is not ask your buddy. Don't get on the forums. Don't, don't get on Facebook and say, what is the perfect scope to put on my gun? Because almost every time they'll tell you what they have is the perfect scope. Because after you go on, out and drop two grand on something, you need to justify it's the best thing you've ever bought. Very few people will say, you know, that thing I just bought, never do that. I was stupid. No one wants to admit that. No. <laughs> right? So most websites have a full spec sheet, and you really have to understand what your usage is. You know, it's it's great. You know, our both our RS3 and RS4 go to 30 power. Um, even when I'm shooting way, way out there, I rarely go there. Uh, because it's tough to find your target. Your field of view is necked in so much that it's really tough unless you're really locked into a lead sled to really find your target at that 30. Um, so, you know, I live in that kind of lower mid range on those. I usually shoot in the 20, 22 range on those. Um, but if you're building a mountain rifle, look at the weight of the scope. Make sure that that's what you're looking at. Look at the tube diameter. You know, so the RS2 is a one inch tube. Um, a couple of our scopes have a 30 mil tube, which is becoming really common. Um, and I'll, t I'd like to talk about tubes in a second. And then the new one, the RS4 has 34 mil tube. So is it going to work for rings? Are you going to be able to get enough clearance from your barrel and from your bolt? You know, look at how much mounting distance there is, if it's going to work for you. Um, there's a lot of companies that make great scopes. Um, you know, I wouldn't be loyal to any brand except maybe ours. But no, I mean, <laughs> don't don't let brand loyalty get in your way. Find what works for you. Find what what you're going to use it for. Um, the cool thing about rifle scopes is, you know, you probably own one, maybe two pair of binoculars, and you can take them whether you're hunting whitetail, you can take them whether you're hunting caribou or moose or whatever. Um, but typically have multiple guns and you need a scope for each gun and each one of those guns is different. Uh, and so really think about your use and think about the application on how it's going to go on your gun. Uh, we get, it's probably less than one in 50, if 
but we do get the phone call of, oh, I didn't even look and I mount this huge barreled um, scope on my gun. I would have to use extra high rings and now I can't get a cheek weld on my butt because it's so high up. Like you got to figure out the entire package because it's a system. Um, and so you want your scope to work with your gun, to work with your cartridge and uh, do a little bit of research, but stay off the forums. <laughs> That's my advice. I think that's I think that's good advice no matter what you're looking at. That is good advice in life. <laughs> um, tube size, tube size does affect light a little bit. I saw this debate on a forum yesterday, and that's what made me bring it up. Everyone's talking about well, you got to have a 34 mil to get as much light through. But the light doesn't actually transmit through the tube. Inside the tube is where the lens elements float in a different tube called the erector assembly. And that's basically floating in the center of the tube. And then your two turrets have screws and offsetting springs so that you can adjust it in that erector assembly in order to zero your scope. And then if you're a dialer and you want to dial to shoot, that tube allows for motion of that erector assembly to really travel uh, vertically a lot so that you can dial out to 100 yards. It's not moving your scope. It's moving a tube within a tube. So it's not letting extra light through. It's giving you more motion. So if you look at uh, a great example is our RS3 and our RS4. They're both five to 30. One's by 50, one's by 56, but one's on a 30 mil tube. And one's on a 34 mil tube. Mm -hmm. And it gives you an extra 30 minutes of dialing on the 34 mil tube because it has more float to travel. So, you know, what's important to you? Weight or more adjustment? What's more important to you? Light or weight? You know, all, all of those things are, again, ingredients in the cake that you've got to decide how you want it to work. Yeah, no, that I think that was I think that was super helpful as far as and like and you said about like any rifle or not any rifle scope, but most rifle scopes over, you know, a few hundred dollars are a pretty good rifle scope at adding the different features. The other one I did have a question on was turrets. And I feel like that term gets thrown around a lot too. And just explaining what the purpose of um, the, the different turrets that, that you guys have, or just really in general, I guess would be if you're, if you're able to. Yeah. So there's, there's three base kind of turrets in my, in my limited opinion. One is a capped turret, not designed to dial the shoot. You use it to zero, you get it dialed in, you cap them, you don't touch them again. The second kind is exposed turrets and they're marked standard with MOA or mills, depending on what your, uh, what particular adjustments you're looking for. And you, Find out what your ballistics and your dope is. And each time you go to shoot, you figure out what your range is. You dial in that adjustment. You hold center on your target. You pull the trigger and boom, you hit it. The third kind, which is the most talked about and often to me one of the most frustrating, is custom ballistics turrets. And custom ballistics turrets are really cool. Um, you get it zeroed, you get your scope dialed, you get online. We sell them for all of our scopes, except for the RS2 right now. You enter your ballistics, all of your environmental factors, everything that you're gonna do to shoot this gun. And then you send it to us and we cut you a ballistics turret. We work with a great company up in Cody called Wyoming Arms, has all the programs and everything. We send it to you, you drop it on your scope and you range 300, you dial this a turret to 300, you pull the trigger and it goes. But that is only true if the conditions when you pull the trigger are the same as when you entered the data for that ballistics uh, trigger. I was talking to a guy from Virginia, I believe, and he went out to his range, got everything set up perfectly, um, bought his ballistics turret, went to the range again. It was money. He was nailing with it came out on his first Wyoming uh, antelope hunt, come up about 6,000, 7,000 feet in elevation. Temperature was about 40, uh, 
degrees different than he shot in Virginia during the summer and got lined up on an antelope at about 440 yards, dialed into 440 and completely missed the antelope over and over repeatedly. And he couldn't figure it out. He thought it got knocked in transit, thought that maybe something had happened with his scope, um, ended up being unsuccessful in the hunt, went home, went back to the range, pulled the trigger and then nailed it over and over. It's because environmental factors are such a big difference. Um, temperature, for example, is huge. Uh, I know we're getting in the weeds on this. No, <laughs> no, no, no. This it's, it's funny when you're, as you're saying this, this was something that, uh, when I got my rifle and put this scope on it and stuff, I talked with one of my best friends who's an active duty Navy SEAL sniper. And he started telling me these things. And I thought my head was going to explode as far as all the details and different conditions that can affect. And he gave a, a very, uh, similar, uh, discussion with me he had about about that with the customizable turrets and and stuff and that's why i wanted i'm glad you went that direction with it because i feel like it 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 sounds cool and everything but it might not be right for your fit i think they're great at the range and and really if you control your environmental factors then then they're great they're they're pretty foolproof they're really good um and I know I'm atypical, but, you know, I live here in Wyoming. I live in town. So our base elevation here is about 5,600 feet. Um, I antelope hunt at about 8,000 feet and I elk hunt at about 11,000 feet. And I can be at any of those elevations in one day hunting because my seasons overlap. And I can get up in the morning and it can be freezing up at elk camp. It can be, you know, 28 degrees and I hunt for a couple of hours and then I go out and antelope hunt on the prairie, drive down a few thousand feet and it can be, you know, three, 4,000 feet lower and 40 degrees higher by noon. Those affect the bullet a lot. So I either need a different turret or a different gun setup, or I use an app like applied ballistics, calculate exactly what it is. And then I dial. Yep. Um, or, I set it to 200 yards, have a 200 yard zero. And I try to keep my shots under 300 yards. Yeah. That's, that's more my personal style, but you know what? I, I do have my ballistics calculated and I'll, I'll, especially on an antelope broadside out in the nice Wyoming Prairie with uh, a good wind. I might, I'm not above taking a 450 shot out there with the right conditions, but so I want to be able to know I can do that, but I love ballistics turrets. We sell a lot of them. I think they're great at the range. I do think they give a false sense of security sometimes. Gotcha. I think, yeah, I, I think that's a a good point with that. Is there anything else with rifle scopes you can think of that would be helpful or any misconceptions you see that, that you'd like to cover on? Yep. Uh, the most likely thing that's causing your rifle scope to misbehave is poor mounting. Okay. Do you want to, um, so what would be, what would be some tips number there? one factor is over torquing them, tightening, tightening the rings too much and pinching that tube so that the erector tube gets pinched in there. Yep. It's a number one cause. If you don't have a torque wrench, don't mount a scope. You, you, you can't, you can't Kentucky windage 18 inch pounds on your ring. You can't do it. <laughs> um, it is actually way less tight than you think it is. Most rings are not designed to touch at the ends and people tighten them down until they're touched. Uh, most float just a little bit. And if you crank them down, you'll actually pinch and crack that tube. Um, if you read, I mean, even our competitors manuals say right in there, if you go over this, you might void your warranty. If you've cracked yeah. the tube, um, we don't do that, but get a torque wrench or, and mount to your rings specifications. Gotcha. That's my advice. The number one thing you can do to make sure your two hundred to ten thousand dollar rifle scope is shooting right is mount it correctly. Loose bases, loose rings, and over torqued uh, tubes will account for the majority of the issues you're having with your rifle. You know, and that's it's funny. That must be why my brother is a gunsmith, and he uh, 
he w- told me when I got my rifle and the scope, he would not let me mount it at all. He, he doesn't live around here. He lives in Montana, but he said, uh, he's like, take it over to my uncle that does a lot of this. He goes, have him do it, drop it off, and then <laughs> then go over and shoot it. He's like, I, I don't want you touching it. With it. He told me what rings to buy and, and everything. And, and uh, yeah, that makes makes sense. He didn't explain it as well as, as you did to me. He just told me not to touch it. So Because he doesn't want to give the secrets away. Yeah, probably. <laughs> like, you only should go to a licensed gunsmith. Yep. <laughs> have the right tools and read the instructions. Yep. <laughs> that that makes sense. Simplified version. Um, so I I would like to transition to the last thing I wanted to cover, which is the new range finder that you're coming out with, and just what what essentially what makes it any different than or maybe I'm I'm really framing this question wrong. Ooh, we got one right in the video here. No one else could see it, but I'm looking at it. Um. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit this hard and fast. By the time this podcast launches, this will be live and hard on the website. We're launching it Monday, March 1st. Oh, nice. So two weeks ago. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. The purpose of this conversation. Um, so the rangefinder has the same quality issues that a binocular does, and then you throw a computer in it, um, right? So you've got glass, you've got all those things, and then you throw a computer into the system and really get crazy with it. Um, There's been some noise lately about using different class of lasers. Um, So there's basically, there's, uh, I'm sure there's millions of classes, but really there's class one, which is what most range finders are. It means it's eye safe. It means I can point this at your face, light it off, and it won't burn your eyes. Um, Some of the companies to get higher ranging techniques have gone with a class two uh, which has limited some of the usages of you know, some of the licensing and stuff on it. We chose not to go that direction. We still use a class one laser, uh, but we put a lot of energy behind it. Uh, we partnered with a uh, basically the premier laser developing company um, in the U.S., uh, Laser Technologies down in Denver, Colorado, and they helped us do all the laser portions of it. Um, we still wanted to do great glass. And so I, you look through it. I don't know if you've had a chance to look through a demo yet. No, nope, not yet. They're, they're incredibly bright. You can use it as a hunting monocular standalone. Um, one of the features that you'll see that's unique to us is we have a wheel that sticks out the side of it, um, which at first glance, everyone's like, hey, that's kind of awkward and weird. But it is brightness on demand. So you rate, you can just twist it and your brightness changes right in the image. You don't have to go into a menu to adjust it. So as the day changes hunting, you know, first thing in the morning, you don't need it that bright. Yep. Then sun comes up and all of a sudden you can't see your reticle inside because it's dim. Now you're trying to see the reticle while you're going through a menu. You're holding it down in your coat to get it dark enough to see. Here you just twist it. Then you hit the button in the center. That takes you into menu mode, and then you use the wheel to go through the menu. So very quick to select from our five reticle options and to go to line of sight versus angle compensation mode, all at the push a button and twist of a, a knob. Um, the other thing we did, it's got this funny little switch on the side that says field and forest. Bless you. Thank you. Um, took us a long time to come up with exactly what we wanted to call those. Some people call them near and far mode or whatever. And the tendency in uh, modern range finders has been to automate that setting. The range finder makes an assumption for you trying to figure out if you're trying to see something at a distance and ignore close things or see something close and ignore distant things. So we named it field and forest and here's why. If your object, if your target is sitting in a field And it's got a bunch of stuff behind it. It's got trees, it's got mountains, it's got big reflective items behind it. A traditional rangefinder is going to want to pick up those trees and give you false readings because they're bigger, they're brighter, they're more reflective than an elk hide in a meadow. You switch to field mode and it returns the earlier settings and ignores stuff behind it. Forest mode ignores things in front and returns the furthest, the biggest thing in the background. So um, sitting in a tree stand in Kansas last fall, 
and I've got a buck coming up the riverbank. Not quite big enough to shoot, so I'm not real. I'm just more playing with my rangefinder at this point, seeing if he drags someone else in with him. But I'm ranging, and I switch to that forest mode, and I'm looking through a hole that's not, you know, I couldn't shoot a basketball through it. It's tight, or and I got consistent heavy 52 yard readings off that deer, even though I had sticks and twigs and branches and leaves all the way between me and him. Huh. It, it, I was able to get that range over and over and over without any, any interference. The other thing that's brilliant on is it ignores snow. So snow is super reflective and super bright and gives you a lot of false readings. Yep. Um, you switch it over to forest mode and it just cuts through the snow. Interesting. It's hard to get your range. And yes, it's a manual switch where everyone else is going automated, but I guarantee my rangefinder doesn't know if I want to see the limbs or see the deer. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it makes assumptions, and I just don't want my electronics making assumptions for me. Um, then bigger p- picture, it goes to 4,500 yards. So it's 5 to 4,500 in a handheld rangefinder. Um, it's not designed or spec to, to do it, but I've routinely got 4,700 yard readings from very bright objects. You do have to hold the button down. It's called building up a target. Basically it sends out a laser. It gets that signal back. It's got to give time for it to travel. Um, if it's getting a variety of readings, it might not give you feedback immediately. So press and hold the button, wait for it to really build up that target to get a further range. It's super fast at shorter ranges, you know, 1,000, 1,500 yards, just chip shots with your bow, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you ever really need to range 4,500 yards? No. no. Is it cool that you can? Yeah. <laughs> it's just cool to be able and, to tell your buddy that you can. And the truth is, because it can do 4,500 yards, it does 1,000 yards fantastic. If the limit was a thousand, it would be okay at a thousand, and it would be fantastic at two hundred. Like uh, I'm, because I'm, of the power that it has in it to get to forty five hundred yards, the practical ranges that you use it with are spectacular. And we've we've ranged a elk hide well over two thousand yards. Wow, that no, that's that's incredible. The the thing that stood out for me is being able to. Uh, even adjust the the brightness there with that wheel because my range finder I currently use I can't use it in sunlight like when it's really bright outside I can't see the reticle without going in and changing it which obviously isn't isn't uh, isn't always that easy to be able to do you know and so that's that alone I thought was a is a pretty pretty cool feature there so. And then it's a very, very bright red display when it's turned all the way up. Like mm-hmm. Bright, bright sunlight with a white background, whatever, it still shines through. We put a lot of, lot of technology into developing this super bright display. Awesome. And then, uh, yeah, that's called the RF1, which, again, that, that really colorful, creative naming system, Rangefinder 1. I love it. <laughs> uh, a- anything else that you think of on the rangefinder side? Um, no, I mean it's. I think um, I'll I will throw in this little tidbit. Uh, hunting rangefinders is the smallest market of the rangefinder market. Um, so we partnered with this same company and. Uh, through a partnership with them and some other people, we're also launching a line of golf rangefinders under a brand called Cobalt. That it makes up 85% of the market for rangefinders. Um, so uh, we're helping launch this brand called Cobalt. So people will see that if you're a, if you're a golfer and you still like that same cool technology and everything, check out Cobalt. It's uh, cool stuff. Interesting. I would never have guessed that. Well, I don't golf, so I, I wouldn't wouldn't know that. But I didn't realize that they used range finders for that. The numbers are astronomical. Interesting. Well, there was there was one thing that that we didn't hit on, and about just the the brand and the company, and that's your warranty. We don't talk about our warranty much because. Um, you froze there for a second. I thought maybe I lost you. No, 
I was so riveting that uh, you paused for a second. Um, <laughs> we stand behind our products 100%, no questions asked. Uh, we have a lifetime no fault warranty on all of our products. That does include our rangefinder. Um, so if it says Maven, we stand behind it. Um, it's kind of becoming the standard in the industry. Uh, it's it's not our selling point for our optics. Our optics are the selling point. They're excellent quality, excellent products. Um, but yeah, we have a lifetime no fault warranty, and so well, if you do decide to make the investment, we will back it up. You're not you're not doing that completely. Um, I, I think how you should because I, from what I've heard and and people that have switch to to maven um or listeners of this podcast and stuff they said the difference that they've noticed if they've ever had to use a warranty for anything was the customer service aspect of it you call and you talk to molly and uh t- where I, i'm not trying to talk bad on any other companies but some of the bigger ones have they might take care of you, but it might take a little bit longer and might be a little bit of a less pleasant experience. So I, I just, I thought that was something I wanted to add. And I appreciate that. Yeah. We, we have an amazing crew here. Um, so Molly, she's our customer service gal and she, uh, she loves to talk. You get her on the phone. She'll chat with you. She loves uh, the product. And then we have uh, Scott back in the back and now Kian, they're doing our warranty repairs and our, uh, customer servicing on that end. And we try and do as much stuff in in house as possible. We do have to send some stuff to our San Diego facility. Um, we are working to bring more and more of that in house, but um, to us, it's a, you know, it's, it's a lifetime. We want to build lifetime customers. Yep. And you do that by taking care of them. And if you've spent a thousand dollars on a binocular and it's not working for you, whether it's your fault or our fault, you're not happy about it. And these things are designed to be in the field, not sitting in my warehouse waiting to be repaired. So we try and get you taken care of, get, get you what you need. We do try to repair as much as possible. Um, I know that's a selling point with some other warranties out there is, man, I, I scuff it up a little bit. I send it in. I get this year's model brand new. Um, <clears throat> there's not a lot of value in that. Someone's paying for that. It's markup in the product. It's whatever. I really try you know, as a team here, we try to repair uh, because we believe that saves us money, which helps us keep our costs low, which helps us continue to be able to sell at good um, direct consumer pricing. So it's it's all a piece of the whole puzzle. And yeah, our I'm proud of our team here. They they do a fantastic job and they, they make it where I can sit on a podcast for an hour and chat with Bo while things are happening. The world's turning around us. Yeah. And so I guess with with that being said too, Kate, I apologize for taking longer than I, I told you I would take of your time uh, to have you on here, but we got rolling into some of these things and I, I misjudged the the timing of it, but I think that I'm very long winded. So no, but I, I think that I think you covered things in a level of detail that is super helpful it's because if someone's going to be spending this amount of money, because optics aren't cheap, they're going to spend this amount of money on something. They want to know the details. They want to know the nitty gritty of it and why they're spending that money. So I, I really appreciate you taking the time and talking with me. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah. Hopefully this one is a little easier to listen to than the last one we did. <laughs> yeah. We we had a little bit of alcohol in our system in that in the last yes. one, but it was it was good as well. Um, it was fun. It was. Uh so Kate, last thing, where can people find um your products at and find some more information on them? The, some of the real detailed specifics. Mavenbuilt.com. That is that is where we live. That is our storefront. That is our home. Um, everything's on there. All of our spec sheets are on there. Uh, you know, there's some great journal posts where other people have got, you know, taken our products in the woods and written about them, um, some reviews. So yeah, check out mavenbuilt.com. And if you have any questions, give Molly a call. She'd love to talk to you. Sounds great. And if anybody decides they want to try out some of the optics, you can use the, the coupon code eastmeetswest-gift and you get a little free gift. Kate will package it up himself and, and give it to I you. I just might. <laughs> Again, thank you so much, Kate, for coming on. You bet. Thanks, Bo. 
Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.